Well, hello everyone and welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV travel, RV living, and RV lifestyles. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, relax, and let's talk about RVs. Hello everybody and welcome to RV Talk Radio. This is episode 52. So that must mean we've been doing this for a year now. Can you believe it? A year ago we came up with this concept. <laughs> it's kind of like, I wonder what it would be like to start a podcast. <laughs> and uh, Oh, I, you know how I am, guys. You say, oh, that's an idea. And we start diving into that. And boy, uh, it's been quite a ride. We've learned a lot of things about running a podcast. And uh, so anyway, welcome to our first annual <laughs> Episode 52 at RV Talk Radio. Well, let's begin. Well, Sherry and I just got back from San Diego, and that was a great trip. And if you watched our videos, you realize we went over there to go sailing. And uh, that turned out to be really neat. But uh, what I wanted to kind of dry- talk about was the drive. And so, <laughs> since we are trying to be RV related here, but um, I will talk more about the sailing as it applies to RVing and and start putting things together for you a little bit. But anyway, so what was amazing is we had to drive all the way through Phoenix, which means we're on the wrong side. We're on the east side, had to get over to the west side. So you get over the west side and then you got to go south and get down by Buckeye, which then you got to hit 85, get down to Highway 8, I think it is, and that goes all the way across to San Diego. Anyway, so we managed that. No big deal. It wasn't that hard to drink. So anyway, so um, ended up on Highway 8 going to San Diego and talk about, I think that's, I mean, I've been to a lot of place roads that don't have a lot to see, but this one is number one on my list. I have, I think I've never been on such a road that has absolutely nothing to see <laughs> i mean nothing it wasn't until we got a little closer to san diego that it started getting interesting but talk about not much of a drive and and some of those roads that road between um the Buckeye area all the way to san diego does give you access to some really nice uh BLM, blm lands um i think uh anyway so the big things we did see is uh, I was really amazed to see some of the solar farms, solar farms, and gigantic things. And, um, of course, they had windmills down there for producing power. So it's really cool to see what would be kind of a barren wasteland area being used for something that could um, help produce energy and seem to not be such an impact in the environment. So let's just leave it at that. And then we did get into some sand dune areas right by the border of Mexico. And that was pretty cool to see. But And then towards the end, it gets to be, uh, I call it the rock people <laughs> uh, must live there. Because it was really uh, a strange formation of rocks. Gigantic boulders, all rounded, not jagged. Um, it's hard to uh, describe, but uh, it, uh, it is a... Uh, sight to behold of I would say the last 60 miles of going into San Diego had some very unusual landscapes so if you get a chance to drive through there that part I I gotta admit is interesting just because of the formations of the landscape it's kind of like a uh, it's hard to describe but anyway it was quite a drive now San Diego itself what a great place. I really recommend if you get a chance to go visit San Diego, um, Sherry and I have definitely got to go back there because uh, there is a ton of things we had to do. But I'll tell you one thing. If you're ever on the water and you've driven and you need to go get gas, do not follow the water line in San Diego because we went on and on and on. And never found a gas station. <laughs> it turns out you need to go a few blocks in. However, that was really a good decision because it allowed us to see what was along the the bays there. So we got to see the Midway and we got to see some other naval ships. 
um, all kinds of just amazing um, tours and ships and uh, availability to get to the water, uh, hustle bustle kind of area. Uh, it was just beautiful and seemed like a really um, nice city that um, is designed to have tourists there. Unlike Seattle, where it feels like you're in everybody's way. And if you get in the waterfront of Seattle and stuff, it's a nightmare right now because of all the construction. But San Diego was just beautiful. And I highly recommend if you get a chance, there's so many things to do between the things you can do in actual San Diego and all the water-related things too, along with great zoos, some great museums. But also if you want to go to like Tijuana or something like that, they have tours that will take you uh, to all the best places to uh, to enjoy Mexico or the Tijuana area, and it really has to do with finding some great places to go shopping and great places to eat when you get over there. So San Diego, uh, double thumbs up for Sherry and I. It's a definitely a cool place to go. Alrighty then. Well, I guess it's time to start figuring out or letting you guys figure out a little bit what is Rob and Sherry thinking about? What's uh, what's the concept here? Well, you know, in the last few months, we've been sharing with you concerns and ideas and uh, insurance and, and traveling and common sense kind of things that would work for not only Sherry and I, but we also discuss it with you, our listeners and our viewers, and get ideas. So the real concept of everything is for us is... Um, since we're not in our senior years yet, is is there some way to do what we like to do traveling and also add the snowbird effect? And you go, okay. So the difference is, is snowbirds typically have a home, and then when the winter comes, they tend to go to warmer weather. So that's the concept. So the Sherry and I, it's like, why does it have to be a home? Why can't it be one recreational vehicle to maybe another recreational vehicle, which in our case may be water related? Just once again, thinking out loud. So we're kind of like looking at sailing as not only some activity we'd love to do is to locate it in the area that we'd want to be in during the summer and then possibly being in a place like this Arizona in the winter now what's cool about either or is when we're not using our RV here in Arizona we can store it which reduces cost significantly when we're not using a say sailboat if that's what we use up in say the Northwest and we're not using it during the off season or cold season, we could put it on land and store it. Uh, so reducing our cost. So you kind of see what's how it's going here is one area we can do one activity and live in it and another activities and things down here in, in the south and live in it, two different places snowbirding but a little bit more than just snowbirding <laughs> um, it's it's snowbirding using two different recreational vehicles one land related one water related and just imagine just the kind of videos and stories we can produce <laughs> between the two uh, should be fantastic so now that might explain explain a little bit of the expansion of our channel to be more outdoor related because now we're not just st doing land projects we could be doing water projects too and so that's the concept that's what we're looking at we don't know if it, oh, exactly how we're going to make it work um you don't always have the answers you, but you got to look at the concepts and then uh, affordability and also keeping um, overhead down. How can we do this and keep our costs down? And then the other thing is we're kind of looking at is because we'd be moving a lot is possibly using 
travel insurance as as our coverage instead of the the Obamacare type of thing, and we're still researching that. Don't have the whole all the answers to that either. But I'm just giving you an early heads up that there is a little. Um, <laughs> we're not totally insane over here. <laughs> We're just sharing, going, let you enjoy the ride with us. And it's not a fun ride all the time. Sometimes you hit dead ends or you just say, this is not going to work. And what works for me and Sherry may not work for you. And so uh, we're really hoping that the direction we're going uh, will be one is a real thrill, a real bucket list check off thing for Sherry and I. Um, there is a little talk that we're looking at doing a trip either to Belize or to Cabo San Lucas for a few days um, to uh, uh, expand our horizons. It's another check off the bucket list thing along with the San Diego. So that will be some really interesting footage and some great videos out of that too. So <clears throat> you can see uh, where we're going with all this stuff. Much more worldly. Uh, probably not what you're used to, um, but we we want to take you along on the ride with us, and so we appreciate it, and, and we do so appreciate the support we've been getting, and um, we always uh, ask, please support us, please give us your feedback. We appreciate it. Um, it just because we choose this path doesn't mean it's the easy path, and so uh, Sherry and I. You might say we're on the easy path now because we're just sitting still and 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 not make taking the big chances. Well, right now, what we're doing is we have this clay, and we call it our lives, and we're molding it to and and changing its configuration till we find something that that works. And so, <laughs> here here's the new configuration that might work, which brings me to the whole thing about RVing and, and travel is, <laughs> is it's okay to think about it. It's okay to talk about it. It's okay to have people look at you and say, are you crazy? Uh, and this isn't for everybody. Um, but once you get the bug, you really, uh, you want to explore and check things out. Now, um, a lot of people have tried to put Sherry and me into this particular mold of what an RVing uh, channel should look like and it's like I don't want to look like them um, I want to make sure we distinctly talk about the difference between RVing and other kinds of, uh, uh, of adventures and outdoor stuff but I'm telling you that if you look at the boating or the sailing side of things they are just like RVers in fact if anything when it comes to boondocking technology and being self-reliant they outdo a lot of RVers they're incredible and uh, I'll probably never be that severe with it as far as producing my own water producing uh, uh, the power like some of them have to but it's so similar you just the only difference is is one is on the water and one isn't and so there should be some wonderful great stories out of both so I ask you to open your mind and enjoy the ride and it's like and enjoy the fact that we'll be different. We're not going to be just RV parks and uh, national parks all the time. It's going to be so much beyond that. And so we're excited and we're hoping you'll be excited too. And and we, we know that not everybody can do this kind of lifestyle. We're inviting you to come along and we're doing our best to do presentations to show you what we're seeing and enjoy life through us and uh, I, I hope we make you smile and that's the important thing next thing I really wanted to talk to you about was uh, uh, Cinder our dog and 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 I uh, I hope that you always know that that's part of our family and and so I wanted to tell you about the uh, place that she stayed at while we were in San Diego and so typically in the past, we've taken Cinder to kennels for um, while we do trips like last, uh, I think at Christmas time, we went to uh, 
Arizona to take the car down and then we've done other trips and we've shared those with you. And the last time I took her to a kennel, uh, it took, she wasn't, she was kind of shook up. So we were like, Sherry and I was like, we got to make sure that we pick out something good for her. So we went to this one place in, uh, uh, Fountain Hills and it's not cheap. It's, it turned out to be like 40 some odd dollars a day, but this place was different. It's more like a resort. And so they get this building kind of goes in a circle and the circle is a big giant playland uh, with fountains and pools and things like that. And so the other thing that was really cool and we've never had this before is, is they have webcams so you can watch your dogs when you're gone and check on them. And so you just kind of figure out what time playtime is for the big dogs. Um, and it's different for the different sizes of dogs. Anyway, so it was really cool because when we were in San Diego, we were able to check on Cinder and see if she was doing all right for that peace of mind. And I'm sure that, I mean, she she was still, you know, she definitely still missed us. She had a horse, you know, I mean, she was very horse voice, she, like uh, she could hardly bark because apparently, I mean, she barked a lot, you know, along with all the other dogs. And so... uh and she was a little insecure a little bit for the first day that she got back and it takes her a while to kind of come off that what's happening you know, she's a very uh, uh pattern dog and so uh it breaks our heart anytime that we it's just so hard to do so many things that we're trying to do especially this year as we're setting things up we can't necessarily take cinder uh, just like um, San Diego, you know, we had some boats to look at and we went out and stuff. You just can't take a dog on something like that. So it's, it's sad when we can't take Cinder with us. Um, but at the same time, we're kind of like, all right, we're going to really enhance Cinder's life um, as soon as we get this clay we were talking about molded into place. So... In the meantime, it's like find the best thing we could. So anyway, I highly recommend that if you're only going for a day or two or three, uh, it's worth spending the extra money for these doggy resorts. Uh, uh, Cinder was uh, psychologically more sound after this trip than uh, times that we've taken her to just kennels. I mean, uh, not only did she get a chance to play a lot and we got to see her, but... We were able to, like, she loves one of those conks, conks, they call them, and we put peanut butter in it, and she gets that every night here <laughs> at 9 o'clock. She's like, hey, put, I need my peanut butter. Anyway, so you can have different things like that for your dog, like extra times to go out to, uh, for potty checks or especially if you have a dog that has a, a small bladder or something. Uh, but Cinder, she was able to still get her kong and her peanut butter. Um and she got the food that we specialize in. She eats canned food at 4 o'clock. She was able to get everything, and she's got a medication she takes. And uh, not a problem. It was, uh, it was really cool. And um, you, can have, you can even get massages for your dog. Like Cinder's not a kind of dog that really <laughs> needs a massage. <laughs> she just needs to play and have uh, interaction. So... Anyway, so it turned out really good. So if you're curious about how Cinder did at the pet resort, she did wonderful. And, can, I mean, for being not with us. Uh, ideally, she'd been m much happier with us, uh, obviously. But uh, if you get a chance to try a pet resort, give it a shot. It's worth it. And if you got a big dog, uh, they need a little more activity and stimulus and uh, so, uh, exercise. So uh, check it out. Well, 4th of July was pretty nice, too, and I thought I'd share a little bit of what Sherry and I did. Is uh, We had the wonderful opportunity to go to our daughters and go see our grandchild and children. And uh, uh, what's really fun about my daughter's place, and I, I, she's such a sweetheart to let us do this, but when uh, she lets us bring Cinder over, and they don't have pets, and, and she grew up with pets, so she doesn't mind, So, but, you know, the rest of the family are so so on having pets, and so anyway, the other thing that's kind of cool is uh, 
we always make sure that she talks with the family, make sure it's okay. But Cinder got to go swimming too, so they got a nice pool. So Cinder was one happy camper, got to do a little bit of swimming, get cooled down. Uh, she swims so well, and so it's that's the sad thing we've had down here in Arizona is, is we haven't been able to let Cinder do the kind of swimming she likes to do. Up in Washington, it's so easy to go find a river, a place that's kind of private, doesn't get anybody upset, uh, and Cinder can go swimming. And But uh, down here, it's not so easy. Anyway, so uh, it was kind of fun to do that. But the other thing was kind of cool is, you know, we're down here by Fort McDowell, which is uh, this, um, well, it's Fountain Hills area, and there's a casino. And the RV park we're at is owned by the Indians on the reservation, which is a great deal. And if you like to go to the casinos once in a while, I highly recommend it. Even if you don't like to gamble, casinos have got a lot of cool things. Uh, maybe you just like bingo, and, and that's always a fun social thing to do. But uh, they always have great restaurants, and we did uh, find a sushi bar over there. It was really cool because you could actually... They have video tape, video cameras right over where they make the, the rolls, so you can kind of see how they make your sushi. So that was kind of cool, and actually the prices were wonderful. But the other thing is, you always want to make sure and get a player's card because what we just found out is now that we have our player cards, and um, we can get, I think, 10 to 15 percent off at the RV park on our monthly fees already. So that's even better. So we're really tickled about that, and. So uh, the other thing I was going to talk about a little bit more is um, the Internet here. And so it's a little different than what I've seen before, and I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about it. So here at uh, Eagle View RV Resort, and that's what it's called here, uh, on the reservation, you they have actually pretty good public Wi-Fi. It's not, it's not bad. Um, it's not, you know. But if you really want some good stuff for a dollar a day, you can get a hard line. And they have most of their spaces have a little connection in the boxes where you can put a LAN wire in and uh, connect to a router and then actually power yourself up with a pretty good internet. And so I, I don't, you don't see that very often in some of the RV parks. And I was listening to another podcast that does RV related stuff. And um, a lot of, and they were kind of being, I don't, they were talking about free Wi-Fi at places you go. And, and it's like, I think they misunderstood. They they kind of plowed into the listener a little bit saying, what do you mean expecting free Wi-Fi? And so I think the concept is we don't expect free Wi-Fi. We expect Wi-Fi to be available under the fees that we pay. So if fees are 550 let's say a month and you don't have internet are you willing to pay 600 a month to have good internet available on your RV park so i think the expectation is no i think we're wording it wrong we don't want free i mean it'd be great to have free internet nobody expects free internet we pay for it at home but we also uh uh want it in the places we go. So if you go to a motel or a hotel or a nice one and stuff, you expect free internet. Well, it's not really free. It's included in the price. I think my answer is with the inclusion of the price I pay at whatever RV park I go to, it would I would like to have good internet available. And I'm not going to use the word free included in my price how's that for wording is so uh i don't i'm not pl i don't want people to be plowed into saying well, what do you mean you expect free internet you don't get free internet at home why do you expect it at rv park i don't think that's really what all of us mean we want good internet based off of the price we pay and so here i can tell you it's worth my rent that I pay for, we have good internet. My rent plus a dollar a day, which is extra 30 bucks a month, I can get excellent internet here. And so I am very grateful for that. And so um, 
internet's I know is always that big debate and and really the best internet is always going to be having a hot spot on your phone and that's not cheap you're looking at at least 110 to on up for whatever bandwidth you need so if if you're just doing normal stuff not like Sherry and I and some of us are making videos and uploading and stuff you can get that cost down but really the most reliable internet you could get is from your cell phone anything else cross your fingers so the get free internet like at a McDonald's and stuff like that they're starting to cap that stuff and they're starting to get wise because all these guys are making these videos telling oh yeah I just uploaded a video at Starbucks or McDonald's or wherever they're at and, and so pretty soon you know somebody's listening to our videos and so they're gonna find out uh, I've heard that they're actually putting buffers on people that deal with um, on free internet when it comes to uploading and so in, in some cases finding ways to block uploading through a free internet service and it's like up oh, there it goes I knew that was gonna happen It's like we're all just like the Walmarts we abuse them and people who uh, don't use them right and pretty soon they're gonna say no more just can't do it anymore and they'll they'll hide under a city ordinance saying well sorry we just can't have you here at all Walmart anymore this city says no anyway I, I wanted to address that because it kind of caught my attention that uh, uh, free internet is really I think the word is in inclusion into our price to have internet available at the RV parks that we go to and and charge me accordingly um, but please have good internet available to the public we'd appreciate that Okay, well, I wanted to talk a little bit more about internet uh, when it comes to hotspots. And the reason I want to bring this up is uh, I watch certain videos and I don't get to watch all of them all the time. It's getting harder and harder because of our schedule. Uh, I did watch Nomadic Fanatic the other day, uh, well, today. And he was talking about when he was up uh, on the Washington Peninsula, which is where I'm from. And his Verizon roamed over to the Canadian side of things automatically and got hit with a big bill. And then it got shut off because Verizon claimed that you know, he had an open bill. And, and, and it's nothing that he did wrong. It's, 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 and it turned out that he had an automatic setting in his hotspot unit that produced roaming automatically to get the best signal. And all it would have taken is, is if Verizon made it clear, but they don't, um, is to change your setting to LTE, which uh, will keep them in, a, in basically in the United States signals. And that wouldn't have happened. Of course, Verizon's not going to like, <laughs> it's after the fact. You know, they, act, <laughs> they go, well, you should have had your settings different. <laughs> It's like, yeah, and, and it's like you're not going to say anything until it happens, and so you, you know, he ended up having to pay that bill. And and the reason I relate to that is we have a hot spot through Sprint, and same kind of thing happened to Sherry and I when we only had a uh, 10 gig hot spot at the time, and uh, what. I thought was when it got to its 10 gigs, it would stop operating. Well, no. And and by the way, I, I called them and I ended up, uh, I got it. I didn't get charged. I got charged for the extra time over 10 gigs. And then I said, hey, no, 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 no. And they actually took it off. And uh, But I asked them, I said, you need to put a throttle on this thing. When it hits 10 gigs, shut me down because your unit is not um, uh, in real time. So a lot of times when you're looking at your usage, it could be higher than what you actually see. And if you're really pushing your limit to whatever measurement you have for bandwidth, um, uh, how much uh, bandwidth you're allowed, uh, if you're getting, if you only have 10 and you're getting like, you're in the nine range and you're getting close to 10 and it's hard to tell when to stop and if you go over the price uh, charge what they charge you when you go over is ridiculous so anyway uh, 
But if you do go over and something like that, you do have an argument saying your unit, if you've got anything like mine, doesn't tell you when you're actually there. And I've asked them, I said, shut me off. I want to know when I hit that that line of my package. If I, I've now got 40, 40 gigs, 30 gigs uh, on my hotspot uh, unit. And uh, what I'm asking is when I hit that, shut me down. I, because your unit's not reliable enough to tell me that I'm actually at the brink of going over it and I don't want to pay for overages. So these cell phone companies are something else. And so you really got to be careful as, as a lot of you've probably found out is all of a sudden, uh, you know, what's all great and fine and dandy and you get your bill and they go, Oh, sorry, you should have done this or should have done that. And so, Oh, maybe you should get on the phone and make some phone calls, but that's a torture too. You know how that goes sitting on waiting forever and, but uh, I gotta admit that every time I've called Sprint, it hasn't been too terribly bad. But I, I, because of the what we do, it's really frustrating to find something that works that isn't. I mean, we still have a three hundred dollar a month uh, cell phone bill because we have three phones plus we have our hotspot, which is a hundred and ten a month, on top of uh, our phones already. So. It's like it's an it's a bill that's like you just can't get rid of, and so it's frustrating. So uh, I really tip my hat to uh, the education that Nomadic Fanatic gave everybody about how to deal with if you're near the border to keep yourself out of trouble and not have what happened to him. Um, and I hope that our information to you is, if you, um, I don't know what other plans are like, but if you're using a hotspot um, like we got. Um, Make sure that call your company, find out if you can actually be shut off at when you hit your total amount of bandwidth, or is there um, if you've gone over and they try to bill you, get on the phone and say, "Hey, you don't have a reliable device to tell me when to stop," and a lot of times they'll give you a refund. So anyway, check it out. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was our Wi-Fi Ranger. Now, I've talked about Wi-Fi Ranger before, and I'm not trying to sell it, but you, um, you can get a discount from us uh, along with RV Locks, too. We, uh, we still have a discount link for that. So if you ever go to our websites and go to product reviews, uh, both the Wi-Fi Ranger and the RV Lock links are still there, and you still can get discounts. Um, anyway, but uh, RV Lock's not considered... Uh, a sponsor anymore but they are a great company with a great product and they've allowed us to have our discount for our clients or our listeners to uh, get the lock with a significant um, discount so we really appreciate that but I want to talk about the Wi-Fi Ranger a minute and how Sherry and I use it now the the Wi-Fi Ranger is not a cheap device it's uh, it costs over about 600 bucks to put it in and, well, this is to buy the unit. That's not called putting it in. You have to pay for that or do it yourself. Anyway, you have an antenna that you put on your roof. Then you have a kind of like a router that's put in. And then you tie into that router with your laptop um, with a, a certain address and log into it and program it to do what you want. And what it does is it looks around for Internet all around you and it can see what's available and it'll tell you whether it's open or secured. And if they're open, like it, if there was a Starbucks within a, a mile, mile and a half of us, and we're at a fairly flat surface, remember these are radio waves. Radio waves do get interfered with between trees, mountains, rocks, other units, things like that. But um, uh, for example, if you went to an RV park and there are uh, internets just at the community center, what we try to do is, okay, all right, if your internet's there, can we put our RV in alignment with the community center if possible? So what they don't know is we're going to try to tap into their system with our Wi-Fi Ranger. Several times that we've traveled, we've been in a situation, especially when you go to Thousand Trails places, they tend to only have their internets at the community center. So just park as close as you can to the community center. 
turn on Wi-Fi Ranger, you can typically tap into it. Anyway, unless you're on a hill or something like that. But anyway, what we do with the Wi-Fi Ranger is it produces a, it's just like a router. The internet comes through that antenna, comes into our router, I'll call it that, our receiver. And then we can see, uh, we can create our own network. So we have a network we created in the RV that we connect everything to, which is really cool because um, we have a wireless Canon printer, we have our cell phones, and we have our laptops, and we tie all those into the Wi-Fi Ranger uh, through that router and whatever internet we have available. So the other thing is, for example, here at the park, I told you we have a hard line into the RV to give us internet. So I brought that into a router by itself. And then that router has a name. And so I tell Wi-Fi Ranger to go look at that router and pull the internet into it. And so once again, even though I am hardlined, all my uh, items in the RV that we use from wireless inter uh, Canon to all of our phones, our tablets, everything, goes through Wi-Fi Ranger network <laughs> and so we really love that and it's really nice uh, it's not a cheap system I understand that uh, but I gotta tell you we have been happy very happy with the Wi-Fi Ranger um, I think they've done an upgrade since then we haven't talked to them about uh, the, the particular router or receiver that they have um, but uh, it's worked very good for us. It uh, has tapped in the internet that we, um, not so much, I mean, we haven't had the opportunity to be like at a Walmart because we try, we don't do a lot of Walmart stuff. If they had free internet, we could just pull it through the Wi-Fi Ranger very easy and distribute it to all of our, our uh, internet hungry devices that are in the RV here. So anyway, but of course to, uh, Walmart, all they see is Wi-Fi Ranger connecting to it, and they don't see the other five units. And and there is a filtering system in the Wi-Fi Ranger to help protect our us from being hacked. So anyway, that's how we do things here. <laughs> that's how we do it, and uh, uh, and we're sticking to it. It's been working good. It's been a good product. I still stand behind it. Uh, so one of these days, I'd like to. Uh, talk to those folks and talk about upgrading our our um, router that they have and see uh, I think the antenna we have doesn't have to be changed just the router and uh, I don't know what the benefits are of that yet so I'll have to do research on that but yep working good internet always a pain in the rear you know that but anyway hope those kind of things will help you out in the future and things you might want to consider depending on how bad you need internet. Well, this week we got some mail in. We, we actually get mail in every, every week. Um, and some uh, we answer the questions or it's something we already talked about in one of our shows. And uh, so we don't necessarily talk about them in this, sh this show. However, I got one from... I hope I say her name. It's Shailene Reynolds, and she gave me permission to say her name and and, and talk about this on the podcast. And she uh, appears to be single, has a cat, and she's from the Alaska area, so she knows how to deal with, uh, with folks <laughs> a little tougher up there. And she, her first thing was uh, she was interested in, uh, she has a, a small business, and she wants to do art show uh, uh, rallies and things like that and so her question was how safe is it and and what's some of the things to look for and and I have to tell you that I don't think I've actually been to any RV park and I'm thinking but that I haven't felt fairly safe and but Sherry and I tend to always make sure that we go to you know popular RV parks and use ones like if, if you're, and I'm not promoting Thousand Trails, but if you became a Thousand Trails member and used their uh, their services, they are actually uh, 
gated communities. And so there's a little peace of mind right there of, you know, nobody's getting through that gate unless they have the code. And then there's uh, uh, a lot of RV parks, like for example, the RV park we're in is on an Indian reservation and their security from the casino across the street comes through here several times a day in nighttime. It's awesome. And some of the security guards also carry like dog biscuits with them. And so they, they're friendly with the people. They know us, they meet us, they play with our dogs and, and give them treats and things like that. And so, uh, here I feel very secure. Um, I think I'm more afraid of the critters than I am of people here. Um, anyway, I think security is more of a common sense thing. If you go for those bargain RV parks and things that were pretty basic, uh, there could be some uh, shadowy people in some of those parks. Uh, I think it's important that you're um, very social. So wherever you do park, get out of your rig and, and if you see someone outside, say hello and talk to them and get a feel for the people around you. And then you can actually all look out for each other. Actually, Sherry, we're, we're, Sherry and I are at a place where we actually know everybody in the row pr pr pretty much here. And we actually watch each other's facilities and check on each other's pets, check in each other. Here we are to make sure that our power is on and our air conditioners are still working. So I literally have neighbors that come over and check that I, my blowers are working and they can see here that my RV works. They actually have the code to get into my, I have an RV lock. So they, a couple of people I trust so much, they have the code to get into my RV, especially if I am worried about my pets. I can call them and we exchanged uh, phone numbers and text lines. So it's really about community, communication, common sense of where you stay. If you are going to be staying in Walmarts and, and parking lots and stuff, you're possibly putting yourself in a bad situation. Um, but even some of those places are secured and also patrolled. Uh, I just... You know, you've heard my shows before about the stealth camping and boondocking. Uh, still, you got to use common sense. Uh, even in an RV park, just put yourself out alone at the end, away from people. You may, uh, and you're worried about security. You may be putting yourself in a bad situation. And then also, you know, I've had people plow into me that uh, about this my stance about safety boondocking and stealth camping and so they recommend that you carry a weapon and i'm not so necessarily keen about that maybe pepper spray uh things like that but a lot of times uh things are going to happen and if you've got a gun let's say you are probably hopefully have it stored in a proper place in a safe place especially like we have grandkids come here if i had a a, a gun in here uh, which I don't, um, I'd be worried about, I mean, it's got to be locked up and, and safe and away from the children. And I probably would not want the ammunition in the, a gun, and I certainly wouldn't want a shell in the chamber. So that's my problem, huh? So uh, I think safety really comes to being common sense. And then if you're, something does happen, most likely, even if you were armed and stuff, you'd probably be caught off guard. Once again, common sense would be is surviving. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, but as I, I, I can honestly say that I don't think I've been in an RV park that I can remember that I didn't feel uh, that it was not safe. And but Sherry and I also you go to popular parks go to common parks and we're very social and uh, um, I think that combination of things will keep you safe uh, I think I know my RV neighbors better than I ever knew any of my neighbors in my houses I've lived in or apartments I lived in the past so I would have to say that it's a better community the other thing is if there's problems in your RV park all you need to do is typically go to the office, talk to them, give them a heads up, and let them deal with the issues. And it's their responsibility to make sure that the RV park is safe. And if they have a tenant that is not 
uh, following or abiding by the rules or causing an issue amongst the community, they need to fix that. The uh, other thing she brought up in the email that she was thinking about a fifth wheel in, in her cat. And um, I, I do want to tell you one experience is when we, our very first time we used a fifth wheel, uh, some reason I thought it would be a great idea to let the cat ride in the fifth wheel. And that poor cat, uh, this was back in 2006, uh, was cross-eyed and bushy-tailed, <laughs> was not real happy about that ride. So what we learned really quick is we put the cat in a little small kennel and put her in the back seat with Cinder, our dog. And when we travel, the cat and the dog dry, uh, ride with us in the vehicle uh, until we get to our destination. Then they go into the fifth wheel. Uh, it's just too rocky, too... Um, I think the cat we had back then also uh, got an upset stomach and didn't uh, <laughs> got sick. So anyway, I recommend that you don't let your animals ride in the RV uh, trailer or fifth wheel uh, because it's just like being in a boat, uh, extreme boat, and so it really messes them up. So anyway, but have your cat, just have them in a carrier. So you get to your place, you pull them out of the rig, put them in their RV and their they feel at home. They're just fine. So, train your cat right from the beginning to use to be in a crate. They'll get, um, they'll get used to it. Our, we've had ours in a crate and traveled with her ever since she was a kitten, and so she travels really well. I know there's other animals that don't, but uh, persistence and a pattern, uh, and the animals seem to adapt. So, give that a shot. But think twice about making them ride in the RV when you're traveling. Uh, not much you can do about a Class A, but those trailers, they rock a lot, so think it over. I'd like to thank Shailene for the note, and it, uh, it's a very long note, and she said it was long-winded, and she apologized. <laughs> anyway, so I just kind of gave everybody a general idea what the note was all about. And she's got a good points that she uh, we should all address. And I want to urge everybody, uh, shoot us notes. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, if it's something that we think is good for the show uh, or reinforces some of the things we've talked about in past shows, uh, we'd love to. And, and uh, we assume when you write to us that it's okay to talk to you. Uh, but if the subject's kind of um, iffy or something, we may contact you and get permission to say, can we t you know, reference you in our, in our podcast just to make sure that you're okay. Uh, Shailene was great. She put a statement at the bottom of her email saying, please feel free to use it in the podcast. And that makes it easy for us. I want to urge all of you, just go to rvtalkradio.com and go to the contact page. And you and it's, very, it's private. Only we see the email. Uh, and so if you have some comments or suggestions or uh, praise or, or anything uh you'd like to talk, have us talk about in the show, please use our contact page. We'd love to hear from you. And, yes, we also get plowed into once in a while, and we, uh, we don't mind that so much if you use, you're courteous about it and you're trying to be constructive to help us make our show a little better, and we appreciate that. Just the other day, it wasn't, um, I can't remember which, maybe it was our podcast. No, it was one of our videos. Somebody plowed into us like, oh, you guys, you're going to be like the winds. The next thing you know, you're going to buy a boat, and um, there goes your RV stuff. It's like, uh, no, we already explained that. It's We're travel-related, and so both will intertwine. And so I just ask people, open your minds a little bit and try. Um, we want our show to be entertaining and fun to watch and give you ideas. So whether we do something boat related or RV related, it's where you go and how you do it and the places you see and share it. And so that's what it's about. And that's what we're about. And so, uh, if we use another tool other than just an RV to get to some of the destinations, I can assure you that we will always have an RV. There will always be an RV talk radio, Always be an RV Travel Quest and RV Travel Buddy. Some of the other things we might uh, change or get rid of. Um, it all depends. On, uh, we're all just we're, we're always trying new ideas. Some are great ideas and some are not. And so that's my message: is guys, if you have something or a dream or a bucket list, please try. Just try. Don't go through life saying what if. 
and and people are going to knock you down or criticize you, but you have to be happy with you. And it's all about your life. And so when you get older, like me and Sherry, and, and there's folks older than us, I know, but the more you realize, did I live the life I want to live? Because now I'm starting to see a little light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not too cool. But at the same time, it's like, how much quality of life have I had? And is there more quality I need? <laughs> you better start checking it off. So uh, take the chances. Try new ideas. And we ask you that we're going to show you different ideas and talk about different ideas with you. Some will come true. Some will not. But I hope what you learn from us is... This is truly living the RV dream, but it's really living your life to the fullest. And hopefully travel of some sort will be part of that lifestyle. And we hope that we can give you some ideas. And if you can't do those kind of activities, that you share this wonderful life with us and be a partner with us as we discover new things and new types of outdoor recreation and things like that and we hope that we produce a show that you like and feel like that you're friends with me and sherry so with that note i want to start saying goodbye to everybody uh this has been a whole year of this uh this is episode 52 well uh, it's quite the milestone we uh, appreciate all the great listeners we have we appreciate the growth we've been having and we love hearing from you, so don't hesitate to give us a holler. We'd, we'd uh, be happy to. Uh, we always try to write back as quickly as possible. And don't forget to check out Outdoor Travel Radio. We always load this, uh, these shows onto that, and they play three times during the day on weekdays. I think they play on Saturdays, and we leave Sundays open. So check them out when you can at OutdoorTravelRadio.com. We truly hope that all of our listeners are having a great summer this year. And if you get a chance to RV, we'd really like to see you out there and try to give us a holler if you're in the Arizona area. I don't expect to see so much in the summertime, but later on. And look us up. We appreciate it. So we ask everybody to be out there to be safe, be relentless, <laughs> and enjoy life. Bye now. Thank you for watching our videos. Please take the time to subscribe and consider being a patron supporter. There is many more adventures and some big surprises coming in the future with your help. Thanks again.